Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt and an MMA fighter with an amazing history and story to tell us about. Mr. Marcio Bittencourt, how are you doing today? Hi, Ken. How are you guys? How's everybody? It was a great pleasure to be with you yeah. guys over here. Hey, man, we're glad to have you. Um, you know, our, our connection came through uh, a mutual friend of George Sotteropoulos. Yes. You guys go way back, and, and he was telling me that. You know, you have an amazing story and you've always been a really amazing athlete. Now you're a great coach. And he was like, man, you got to talk to this guy. It's just there's so much history there of just his journey and what he's been able to accomplish. So that's what we're here to do. And I wanted to start that off with, you know, kind of how you got started in martial arts. You know, wh what age was that? What did it look like? Who were your influences? Oh, man, thank you so much, Caleb, you know, for this opportunity. And it was this, I thank to George, my great friend from Australia, to make this connection, to introduce us. It was a great pleasure. All right, brother. So uh, I started martial arts, you know, I, in 1985, when nine years old, you know. So my family, it's all martial artists, you know, but they always are strikers. No, really? no, I was just a grappler, yes. They all came from karate, and boxing, taekwondo, hapkido, you know, different martial arts, but always striking. Came from my grandfather. My grandfather was a karate black belt. Okay. So, so my dream was go to the academy since like maybe two, three, four, five years or very, you know, but I couldn't go right away. So in my school, so they started having a judo class. And then I started doing judo class at 9 until 16, where I was very good competitor. What's funny things, uh, I demonstrated already talent in the martial arts for the first class I did. I remember the first class, I didn't know nothing about judo, but for the old beginners, it was blue belts and yellow belts. I threw everybody in the first class. All the kids, I threw them. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know even how to do it. The professor said, how are you doing this? I say, I had no idea, just, you know, just by instinct. Yeah. So by that day, I started falling in love with the martial arts. So when 16 years old, I was like a very good competitor, but I felt like judo was still missing something like about like defend yourself and be like a, a fighter. So when I grew, I started going out to the girlfriends and then I went, you know, had like a life, like, so I, I need something who could like protect myself and give me more confidence. So then I changed and make a quick change for jujitsu because jujitsu was exploding at the time. It was right by Hoysi Grace and stuff, you know, when this thing like blowing up. I say, wow, it's very close. It was similar. I see very similar things. And they started getting value to in Brazil at the same time as well. So I used to go to watch it and I see my first professor, Ricardo Carvalho, was fighting Vale Tudo. He came from judo as well. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So, okay, this is, this is perfect for me. A short guy, light, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I said, that's all I need. So then I started. But when I started jiu-jitsu, it was a big advantage because I already was a brown belt in judo. So, but it was a white belt in, in jiu-jitsu, but it's still my skills, what I already had in judo as a competitor, you know, helped me a lot in the beginning. So I remember when I started competitions in jiu-jitsu, I used to win absolute and division, white belts, blue belts, because the judo skills really helped me. So then I started this whole thing, you know, then I started getting professional, then I started getting valetudo, and then I started doing international fights. Well, my first fight was in Australia, in K1, me and George. Yeah. I'm gonna tell a very funny story about this thing too, about my fight and his fight was a great experience in my life. But that's all the whole thing started, you know, in martial arts. Where, uh, where did you grow up in Brazil? I'm from Salvador, Bahia, Brazil. It's like about Northeast. It's two states above Rio. Rio de Janeiro had yeah. Espiritu Santo, then is Bahia. It, uh, is it near Maceió? You know, near what? Is it near Maceió? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maceió is the capital of the state it's called Alagoas. It's two, yeah. it's two states under. By uh, in Maceió, it's about five, six hours my my capital to Maceió. I I, I fight already in Maceió a long time ago in the north. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's uh. We always take a we do a BJJ camp in Maceió. Um, oh, really? 
So we've been going there for like 10 or 12 years. Oh, so. that's awesome. That's beautiful beach. The city is awesome. Yeah. I know some people that, uh, Diogione. Diogione is where we train. Vicent, Vicent. Yeah. You know, yeah, Dia Joni, uh, Dia Joni uh, school is with him and Bianca. That's where we go train because. Right. Uh, so my coach had, had brought Tony Emmanuel over back in the '90s, and he lived with him. And then he moved back to Brazil, and he moved to Masio. Well, um, he married into Dia Joni's family, so that's where he's been training for the last 15 years. So when we go to Brazil for camp, we always go to see Tony and Dia Joni. So yeah, it's small world. That's funny. It's small world, but you see, it's, yeah. you know, that's crazy. You know, just the end of the day is all connected. That's it. So now you're doing BJJ. You're competing in MMA a little bit. When did it become a career? When you were like, okay, I'm going to try and make a living doing right. martial arts. So when I, when I turned, I started jujitsu 16 years old, right? So when about 1999. I was about purple belt. Like yeah, I started jiu-jitsu in 1992. So let's say five years later, I was purple belt. But there is not that many black belts. So I started teaching. My 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 group I was representing Edson Cavallo team at the time. So the group is growing. There's a lot of people who want to learn. So the purple belt start teaching things. You know, you go for some. So I opened my little little spot and start teaching jiu-jitsu too. Whatever I learned in the morning in the class with professor, I was try duplicating. That's what all I try to do. So, and uh, I remember that time I, I start working like a delivery things, like, um, let's say it's not a, DHL, you know what DHL is? Like, like a post office, Korea post office, you deliver yeah, yeah, things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I remember I make it like say $500, so very short month. So then I start teaching a, like a, a like a, um, a part-time job. So I work in the morning, at the night I go teach. So, and I remember say, if they start to make you just $500, I'm going to quit this job and I'm going to live my life with you. That was my first goal. Yeah. I remember, so then I start I make it the same money I was in the job. I did in jiu-jitsu, say, you know what? Now it's going to be my, my career forever. I love to do these things. You know, I did this like since nine years old, judo, my whole life dedicated. So I see the, the shine, you know, the, the light in the end of the tunnel. So, okay, so let's start with this thing. And you start the results coming. I open my own club, I open my own gym, you know, and I start making more fights and the name is growing in my state, in my country. So it's a lot of students came, you know, and then, you know, that's when the whole thing starts. What was your, uh, where was your first professional MMA fight? Was it in Brazil? Yes, it was in Vale Tudo. Well, the first, my first professional fight was in Vale Tudo. I remember winning the fight with the, the head bumps and the, the elbow 12 to 6. You know, what's yes. today totally legal. Oh, yeah, not legal now. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it was about 2000. That was my first uh, professional fight. But before that, we had like a couple fights in, in the, um, inside the gym when you close the door. And you had like a real fight because I had no the match shows with the whole rules against Capoeira, against Luta Libre, you know, so to see what's better style. Yeah. That's what I'm about. The, uh, the old school dojo storms. Oh, man. Absolutely. Yeah, silly stuff. Yeah. So how did you end up fighting in Australia? Yeah, it was, it was, that was very interesting story about this time because of my first prof, uh, international fight, right? It was from Brazil, I was a red black belt, it was about 2004, December 2004. So I have a partner, Daniel Lima, who was living in Australia at the time, you know, and we found Fight Club together in 2000. We found the team Fight Club, me, Hector Lima in Europe, and Daniel Lima in Australia. So when they start bumping and pump it up and show for Japan, shows in, a, in, a, in Australia, wins, wins. And then when came the opportunity to fight the K1. Remember K1 that was a big yeah. event? Oh yeah. Like, yeah, so a K1 in Australia. So they invite me to fight four months before the fight. I say, wow, four months I had a good time to train, everything. So I did my whole camp, but my opponent wasn't, wasn't joy because we're not the same division. George is way heavier than me. I mean, I mean, fight 145 the most, 
you know, and you walk around the one fifth that can walk around. And my opponent was the New Zealand guy, the striker, uh, Matt Tipa, was him. So I trained four months. In the, at that time, you still have a lot of striker against grapplers. So my, you know, it wasn't that too much. It was a different time, like about 16 years ago. So we, and then I did my whole camp to fight against somebody striker. So my camp was clean. She take the guy down, drown him on the ground, smash, ground and pound. What about this performance? But what, I had a problem in visa to get the visa quickly to Australia. So I just couldn't get in Australia at the day of the waiting with a big jet lag, 36 hours flight, Brazil to Australia. The hours opposite. Yeah. So I landed in the airport and my partner came to me and it was a funny, very funny saying, Marshall, I had two news for you. One good, one bad. Said, Please give me one good news because if you give one more bad news, I'm gonna, you know, gonna knock me out of it. Even before, because it was so rough the whole flight. And uh, the good news, I get a sponsor for you. So I have this money. So you can use the t-shirts and wow, nice. But the bad news is Matt Tipa, he declined the fight in the short notice. And then we couldn't find anybody in your division to replace. We get a guy from Melbourne, George Sochopolo. He's a little heavier than you. He says, it's a little it's, bit. Yeah, just a little. A little. Not much. And what, but, but I trained for four years, four months for this thing. So you know what? I'm already here, so let's do it. You know, so and then I, when I and George told the guy, he said, "Listen, it's too short. I cannot even cut one. It's not time. You know, you come today, I go tomorrow. If the guy accept yeah. to fight the weight I am now, I do it. I say okay. So then we start. But uh, this was like um, the fight for me for the jet lag was kind of yeah. nightmare because what happened is I feel everything in slow motion." You know when you guys have a nightmare, you try to punch somebody, everything is slow. And that's yeah. exactly what, what was reality. With somebody <laughs> big, really good, you know yeah. what I mean? So, but it was an amazing experience for me, you know? So I lost the fight for him, of course, you know? I couldn't, you know, like go that long, especially in slow motion. But it was an amazing experience. And the best thing what happened is, after this whole thing, we made good friendship, me and him. You know, so he came to visit me in New York. You know, I could have had a chance to see him again in Australia, but I'm gonna see him soon, you know. But that's a good, the beauty of the sport. You Absolutely. know, things happen like that. And then after that, you know, we, he's a yeah. good brother, you know. That's Absolutely. Great. Yeah, I remember uh, we went down to see him last year and we showed up on New Year's Eve and, you know, the flight's so long and just difficult, but luckily, for New Year's Eve, we were good because, you know, our times were backwards. So in the middle of the night, when they're celebrating New Year's Eve, it was like day. So we were kind of wide awake, but man, it, yeah. took about, it took about two or three days to kind of feel normal. Like we'd go to the gym and train yep. and I would just be so tired. <laughs> I'd be I, like, know, man, I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. And he doesn't know that, but after this fight, he built like very strong, he make me better. You know, yeah. because I feel very confident. Listen, if I could fight with this guy way bigger than me, with whole bad conditions around me. So after that, when I back to Brazil, I was another level. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Completely. I know. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Because it's like when you get thrown into like the lion's pit and when you go back home, you know, or you go back to different competitive circles, just it's almost like your confidence allows you to perform at your true Absolutely. Level. You know, yeah. Yeah. I know exactly mm -hmm. what you I had a training camp that I went to years ago when I was just a nobody training and, and went and worked with, uh, you know, Team Quest and all the team, you know, Randy Couture and Lin Lin and Corey and all those guys. And when I came back home, like, you know, I was a lot better, but it wasn't because I learned so much. It was just my confidence was up. Like, I it's believe mental. It's a very sport. It's mental sport. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Moving forward, you had more MMA fights. Um, when did you kind of make the transition out of being a fighter to more of just being a coach? Yeah, was well, like like I said. Remember, um, I started teaching since Purple Belt. 
Yeah. So my whole life, I and then I owned my own gym. So my, my biggest um, challenge was always divide myself split in three things. Fighter, athlete, mm -hmm. and uh, owns a business, businessman, right? Because I own my business, and coach. And successful, and I gotta be successful in all three things. Yeah. And then thank God I did very successful in all three things. I did very good career in MMA. I had a great students everywhere. And uh, my team was doing pretty well. So what I, what I, the way I found to manage this thing was like this, for example. Let's say, right, for the 100% of my time, in normal, like I had no fights, I split 33%, right, at each part so I can do all three. But let's say I had a fight. So I dedicate, let's say, 60%, 70% as a fighter and reduce like owns the business and the coach. Yeah. Or if I'm not fighting, and then my focusing coach, I had people fighting, students fighting, or tournaments coming for my students. So then a little bit, you know, so I reduced the other piece, other part, and focus more in the things that I needed to do at that time. You know what I'm saying? So that way I couldn't manage it. But I, to be honest, I never could dedicate 100% like as a fighter, I wish to be, yeah. but if I do the thing, I couldn't, I need to stop teaching, what to pay my bills, close the gym, you know, so what's the way I couldn't feed the fighter? So I, I live the life better than have a regular job. So, you know, I have my own gym, I live, have things around this thing, all day in the gym, four, five, six, seven hours, practicing. So this makes you sharp. Constantly, because I was real, I was teaching, I was connected, you know. And that way, I couldn't, you know, do the things that I'm doing now. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And then, so, when did you decide to move to America and, you know, kind of set up your establishment there? Yes. Um, my gym in Brazil, right, was, well, my, my grandmother owns the, the build, all right? But she died in Brazil in 2011. So they, they sell the, the, the build, right? And then uh, at that time, it was hard for me and other work to, real, to buy the thing. So I had an option at that time. I was teaching the current uh, UFC champion, Amanda Nunes. You know, Amanda mm -hmm. Nunes from the UFC. Yeah. I was a yeah. head BJJ coach. She started with Eto Cavallo, and then she left. As Cavallo was the same professor we started, and then she started training me. And that time she won the strike force. She, she knocked out Julia Bird in 35 seconds, bang, left the jab, boom. She dropped the girl, she's blowing out. And then she invited me to come to America to, you know, to, for the fights, for the preparation. So then I, had, I came to America for four months in France to see how America goes. I never came before here, so I see things. So, and then I had the time, the, the time in the four months here to decide if I back to Brazil and open a new gym because you know my grandmother died before passed away, mm -hmm. or I try a new life or get the money instead of open the, the gym in Brazil, move with my family to America and try a new life in America. So when I came here in 2011, right away I see we, especially my area that I live, we had like a lot of good fighters. But I see a big hole in the market about good Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coach at that time. That I had that much black belts in 2011. Say, wow, this could be a good opportunity, you know, so to, to teach him, explain you know, the, the knowledge of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So then I decided to, to come to America for her. I go back, bring my family, you know. Unfortunately, after we, we in America, me and her, we you know, we like, we split, we get a fight, whatever, you know. It's, uh, she runs her own way, I run my own way, but I'm so happy now to be here, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, it's perfect. Now I have my gym, I have my team, I have a lot of affiliations, you know, that's, I think it was the one of the best decisions that I take in my life to, yeah. to come to America. Well, but when you think about as a martial artist, it's usually focused on constant growth. You know, like that's the whole idea of martial arts. You need to grow. You need to expand, do new things, try out new ideas, which that's what you've done with your life. You know, was it was like, 
I love martial arts. I'm going to be a competitor. Well, I like being a competitor, so I'm going to become an international competitor. Well, I enjoy traveling the world, you know, with my school, so now I'm going to move my school to a new country. You know, like it just, that's the martial attitude that has kind of created success in your life. So my question would be, when you were younger, what was your definition of success, you know, 15, 20 years ago? And what's your definition of success now? What has changed over those years? To be honest, the, the base of the success that I still think, like from 15 years old, is the same. Because it's not about how much money, for me, successful is not how much money you make it, or, but it's about your dream, it's about your goal. If you can make your goal happen, if you can make your dream happen, you are successful. Right? Could be like a, but let's say, could be the, the, the dream could be like spread out the jujitsu all over the world. If you do that, you're successful. Doesn't, make, doesn't mean you make you millionaire and make crazy money. You, you, money is just a consequence. In, in my head, it's a consequence of a good job you do. If you do a good job, money's going to be a consequence of this thing you have been doing. You know? But I think successful is you know what your dream and make your dream happen. If you can make your dream happen, you are successful. That's beautiful, man. That's so much truth to that. Like, it just, uh, people get caught up so often in, you know, the metal, the belt, the money, you know, like the destination of where they're trying to go and they miss out on the journey. And so it just, uh, it's very insightful for you, for you to see that and be able to pass that on to people. So then the next question would be, what is the number one struggle that you see people have in finding their passion? I'm sure you've had students come to you and say, Marcio, I don't know what my passion is. I don't know what my dream is. I don't know what I want. You know, like, what do you feel like the number one struggle really is for those people? I think two things, right? First, we've got to try things in your life, different things to discover yourself. You know, you gotta try. So then you can discover your talent. What do you, you, you never know, let's say, if you are talented in, in football, in basketball, if you never play, if you never try. Or oh, for, uh, for, for, for lucky, I get a martial arts right away. I already knew since, but some people don't know what, you know, what the talent, what they are. They, just, they need to discover themselves. To discover themselves, they need to try different things. You know what I mean? So as long as you, you try different things, then you can set it up what your your way, what you to need to, to go for. It, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. I think that that, uh, that speaks to a lot of, you know, what teachers and educators are trying to do with kids, you know, nowadays is get them to experience different types of culture and different types of activities and, and have a more world view you know, and instead of a narrow one, um, which, which brings me to the question about what does martial arts do that actually fulfills you? You know, you know, like what is the fulfilling part that you feel that martial arts provides people? My friend, I always say that, Caleb, for everybody. The minimal part of martial arts give to people is to learn how to fight. That's the smaller part. The change of the life of the character, of the personality, that's the real things coming from martial arts. If you realize the, the dojo, right, the, the place we train is a small universe. When you say a small universe, it's a place you can get contact with feelings, good feelings and bad feelings we, all, we have. Every day in that, you get fears, you get some time to be humble, you get to, you, you perseverance, out confidence, bad and good every day on the mat. So you work your person like religion through the martial arts, get, make you a better person, make you better every day through the practice, through the practice. So every day you get in contact or you see like a kid, how many times you see kids, they, they don't know the potential, they get scared or suffer bullying in school. And after six, seven, eight months, they change. They get like, I don't say like overconfident, but they get more confident, out confident. Yeah. I used to say, 
whatever you be you become in in your life like a doctor lawyer engineer whatever if you be a black belt in martial arts gonna be better because you're gonna be better lawyer you're gonna be better doctor why because first of all you're gonna have more confidence in yourself you you especially if you come to competitions you know you're capable you already taste the successful since kids you know, you, you feel you're capable to win competition because in the end of the day, life's a competition, right? Absolutely. So, so you learn these things. So that's the true things martial arts give to people. Then, plus, we learn how to fight. We learn how to defend yourself. We learn how to defend your family and people around you that you love, right? But that's my opinion. That's the number one thing martial arts give to all of us. You know, and that's very insightful because how often because you, you look at you know kids and, and what parents are trying to provide for kids and you a lot of times you hear i don't want my kid to go through what i went through you know i want it to be easier for my kid than how it was for me you know i want my kid to be safer than what i was but when you look at these success stories you know and even your own journey you were chiseled and formed by your struggles so it's almost like we need to provide an opportunity for kids to have these struggles, but maybe in a safer environment, like a martial arts school. Because, you know, even in a martial arts school, there's going to be kids that are bigger and stronger. So they're going to be, you know, kind of on the lower end. Um, in a martial arts school, there's going to be kids that are smaller and newer than you are. So you have to be a leader, um, you know, and there's going to be interpersonal problems. There's going to be kids that they don't get along with. There's going to be kids that, you know, or, you know, pick on them or they have an interpersonal problem, but that's a very safe environment for them to develop those skills. So that way they're not having to develop it, you know, outside in a different environment where maybe there's no safety net. Absolutely. You know? Wrong way. It's a good direction, yeah. you know. And also too, not just for the kids who suffer bullying, but sometimes kids are super aggressive too. Yeah. And then in bad directions could be bad for them. So if you get this aggressivity and drive for the right way, he could be a good athlete, yeah. you know? Because in the end, the aggressive is good. If you direct for the right way, make you want, make you want thing, make you, you know, you overcome stuff. Yeah. So that's, but you gotta drive, like you said, in the martial arts school, you know, in the right way, you know, and then could be like, that's why sometimes you become excellent athlete. That's a big difference in America. I really love the thing because in America, we put the kids right away in the beginning in the martial arts school, learn the right way. In Brazil, we get a lot of street fights to learn these things. What's not safe, you know? So I, I, I used to remember these things like in Brazil, like so much for street fights that when a kid in the school, kids try to bullying. It's a different way to make you tough, but both ways, it's great. But in America, is the right way to put like the kids right to the beginning, teach discipline and everything the way they, they need to, to learn, you yeah. know. Because yeah. this one's learned in, the, in the, the rough way. Yeah. Do you, um, how much value do you think there is? Like whenever kids do the martial arts, what do you think is more valuable? Whenever they are successful in the martial arts, or whenever they have to be unsuccessful in the martial arts. Like, I'll give you an example. Whenever I get to go in and I get to hold the kid down and full mount for the whole round and be like, yeah, you know, I won. Or is it more useful when the kid has to be underneath full mount for the entire round? Which one do you feel is more helpful? Uh, yeah, th this is very, very important. And so I see these things happen constantly in many schools that I watch. The professor has to be a big feelings when you're talking about kids. You have to be like a psychological thing. Of course, they need to go overcoming and working hard, but you cannot let your kid leave the class frustrated and feeling down because they hold down the top mount for the whole mouth. So you've got to feel because the body language shows you before they even say it. If you pay attention to you, the body language is going to tell you when it's time to change. You know, and sometimes it just to go there and change the position. Hey guys, you're stuck in this position too much. So let's change. They, re they don't realize I know what's going on. 
you know, they just stand, they start open, big smile. Hey, wow, so then we start again, you know? So to work with a kid, it's very, it's very, let's say, not to say hard, but you gotta pay attention every detail in body language because the same way you can get the kid, you can lose them quickly too. Like you said, the other one bigger melt, hold them down, and they struggle to escape for two, three, four, five minutes because the, the round's not over yet. You cannot take it off the other kids in the top. So the other kid leave you crying. You make the other one happy, the other one cry. So you know, this balance I don't think is working good. I, I rather everybody, you know, I take it off the other one, be, you know. So that's the way I do it with my kids. If I realize it, they're getting too over, gonna start, uh, I change position, make they stand up, or try the other one play bottom, the other one try to pass the guard, the other one try to sweep, you know, that way make everybody happy. So, everybody's training hard. So you basically, you adjust the training methodology for the needs of the individual student. Absolutely, absolutely. So when you look at adults, and you're training adults, which are basically big kids, um, how do you have to treat the adults differently, you know, than the kids? You know, because inherently, first of all, do you feel that the adults have the same problems as the kids? Mm -hmm. Like you said, but, the big kids. Exactly. So, but do the adults think they have the same problems as the kids? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like most adults, they're like, no, I don't have that issue that that little kid has. Like, no, I'm an adult. I have a job. Yeah, I'm yeah, doing yeah, all yeah. this, right? <laughs> So the adults don't think they have any real problems. So how do you help the adults kind of become more open about, you know, the real issues, you know, how do you help them gain momentum since they're basically unaware of what the core issue is? Mm -hmm. So to, to, you got you to first of all, like separate two different aspects, like two different groups. So what do you want in Jiu-Jitsu for us? Some people who want to judge, so like their competitor could be like a world champion. But the majority of these people don't want to, like the beginners. You know, for example, doesn't make sense to me. Like you see people like come like a beginner for the class and people start show De La Riva and Baron Bolo. But the guy had like two weeks in class. Sometimes they, they, they I understand that they want to show, they know, but it's too much, you know? So these things make the people lose it and, and leave the gym. If you introduce jujitsu in the right way, step by step, you know, you break a lot of these this problems happens during the match with the adults too. Frustration. The, the two big reasons the white belts leave the gyms is, one is the technique sometimes, too advanced, they get frustrated because they cannot follow the movement. that's one. And the second one, the constant lose for the highest rank, they get this encouraged. What's well, the same problem as the kids? You see, it's a big kid. They're exactly the same problem as the kids. They live because, they, for example, the guy comes, they think they are very tough, lifting weight, 200 pounds, 210, get a rooster weight, purple belt, and the guy choking, got on back three, four, five times, six, five minutes. The guy probably, if you don't be a very tough guy, like a small percentage, so I will come back, but the majority is gonna say, wow, I'm not the, thing, the guy that I think I was. I'm not that strong that I think I was. This is not for me. And they believe, you know? But if you teach everything properly, step by step, so they learn before they start getting a fight. And um, the education too, like when I say education, like make your, your gym, your class, like a big family. People's helping each other. You start instead killing each other. When they, some, some schools, the big schools, they all just get your kids, jump in, train and smash as much people as they can and go home. No, that's not the way it should be. If you see the white belt, teach him, help him. For example, when you hire a rank, when you're a professor, you use, it's hard for your student what you teach teaching, catch you, right? But I'm used to put myself in bad situation all the time you know, to, to, to keep it constantly fight, um, in contact with, with the news. You know what I'm saying? Oh, or let's say I'm gonna try to tap you like in a minute or two minutes. If I don't tap in two minutes, I lose, you know? 
this way make you keep going, keep going. Because if you just win, you're not going anywhere. You're not, you're not, not developing, you're not improving. You need to lose to improve. You need somebody. So that's why the way I keep doing. So if you do everything, you pay attention. And more important thing, respect your students, love your students. And this debates for you do a good job with this. People are gonna feel it, how you taking care, how you, you know you care about each other. I even teach my school a lot of heel hooks and feet below the waist, but have very, very few losses. People don't get hurt because they take care of each other. When I see people put it on and they see the guy don't know how to escape, they stop and explain, hey buddy, listen, if you escape that way, you're gonna get hurt. Instead of be the evil, oh, I gotta attack you. I gotta attack you. I gotta attack you. No matter what, I wanna attack for you. I don't wanna attack for you. And both and break the legs and you lose and lose and lose student. So it's all about how you lead your team. That's what I believe, brother. Makes sense. So, I, I mean, that makes perfect sense. So you've created a culture of, of you know, helping each other and you know, move the team forward instead of moving the individual forward. So um, what do you do to influence your higher ranks to remind them of that culture? Because, you know, we all run into that time where you get those guys that have been around for a while, they have their own style, they're running their own game, you mm -hmm. know, they know some stuff. How do you keep them focused on the overall goal of the culture you know, for that in between, you know, I kind of like, I call it kind of like the teenager years of jujitsu, usually around purple belt is whenever, you know, you'll see that where they, they, they want to be established as their own person and they are their own ideas and techniques. So how do you keep those guys on track? Well, I'm going to give you a very, very quick example about it. It's very common when you see a purple belt or a brown belt start to learn a little bit and they think they know a lot and they start teaching the middle of the class, you teach something, they you know how I make everybody humble? I have in my gym a program called Grace Garage. We do like a Grace Garage self-defense. It's basic, off the basic, off the basic. When they go black belts, when they go there to teach like learn simple mount escape, for example, with the whole little details, angles, cribs, you know, all science, they go all right away humble because, wow, I don't know that much. Or for example, he tried to show Barry Bowl, I show Americana. But I show a video of Americana when he had no idea. Wow, I'm a black belt, but I don't know that. So I'm focusing in Barry Bowl, but I don't know how to do Americana. Or I don't know how to distribute my weight in the top amount correctly, and then I'm a black belt. You see? You see? So immediately the guy go down and they say, wow. I need to work the basic, the, the right way. So, now, and then also too, the way we talk, the way we, we explain positions, you know? And then I keep telling my students, we gonna learn, start to learn jujitsu, you are gonna born in jujitsu when you get your black belt. It's too, brother, it's, you, you black belt too, can you black belt? See, brother, look, tell, tell me, remember when you get a brown belt, when you, the day you get a black belt, how you feel at the day? You feel it was the end or was feel just starting? Yeah, it was definitely the beginning because it was... The beginning, brother. You can it's... ask it. Every black belt, they're going to say that. The real black belt is going to say that. When I, I, I taught you when I was... Me too. I taught you a new when I was purple belt. I taught you a new jiu-jitsu when I was brown belt. Yeah. But uh, when I get my black, I say, wow. Then I, now I start to learn. Yeah. You I know, so I constantly like, tell them this. I always felt like... When I started getting close to my black belt, I felt like I started understanding jujitsu less. You know, like I, as I was getting, you know, as I was becoming a higher rank brown belt, I was like, oh my gosh, man. Because I just started noticing all the details, all the subtleties. Yes. And it was becoming overwhelming. I was like, there is so much stuff that I just don't know. You right. know, because my view had gotten much narrower, like, it wasn't, do you know an arm bar? It was, do you know the exact grip on this arm bar where your hip placement is exactly? Exactly. So, um, so I can, so when I got black belt, I was really kind of like, man, this is going the wrong direction. I thought I was supposed to feel better at black belt, but um, it just, you start seeing how vast it really is. And I can remember I was that blue belt, purple belt 
because I was a cage fighter and I was young and athletic and competitive and I knew stuff. And, and honestly, it was more pride and ego, you know, than it was mm. actually believing that I knew better. It was just, it was really insecurities just trying to like, Oh, look what I can do. You know, I'm important. Look what I know. And, and I was teaching and running a school because we didn't have a choice. Like, I mean, it, there was no black belts. It was go learn from black belts, go back to the school. We all trained together. And, um, you know, and even when I got my black belt, I just felt like we were even more of a conglomerate learning team that was like, guys, it's not about what I know, because I don't know everything. It's about the principles and the fundamentals that we adhere to. So we learn yeah. as a group, you know? Um, yeah, it definitely is definitely the beginning, but you can't tell that to an underbelt. Like there's just- No, you can Just when they, they get like their own experience, they're gonna agree with us. Oh, now I understand. The same thing when, when your father tells you when you were when you were a kid and you don't understand. When it when it becomes a father, then you understand everything. So oh, yeah. now I know. Yeah. Now I know right. when you go yeah. out there and then, you know, yeah. the same definitely, thing. There's definitely rites of passage. So and, and that brings me to my last thing is what advice would you give to somebody to help them not make as many of the mistakes you know that you made coming up or that others have made you know what's the advice that you try to give people to where they don't you know because they're going to make mistakes and those are important but it'll help them make less mistakes like you're going to have a is more mistakes like in terms of fights technical mistakes or, or in terms of uh, in, i would say in terminology of like just being a good student to get the most out of martial arts to get the most out of martial arts and you're kind of beginning with martial arts, here's my advice to you. My advice is be humble all the time. Always feel you don't know, never know enough. Like I'm black belt for degrees. I get my black belt 2002, right? So it's about 18 years already. And I, I, I from the deep of my heart, I'm telling you today, I'm learning jujitsu every day. If you ask me if I know jujitsu, I'm gonna tell you I don't know enough. It be on, it's honest. It's not just, oh, no, try try be fake humble to sound good. No, I really think because when I look myself, when I see like Master Hilo Grace, the guy's like 67 years, 80 years in practice, or Hickson Gracie, or Hoyle Gracie, the guy's like 50, 16 years on the mat, hours and hours and hours on the mat. So this makes me thinking about it, like how many experiences people have how many different ways, how many times he teach, how many questions they answer for people. How do this, how I do that, if I should do this, if I do this, if I do that. You know, so I really believe in hours and hours on the mat. That's give the, the road for you, the background. So I'm doing this for a long time, but I still see people doing this way longer than me. You know, that's making me feel like I need to keep learning. I need to, and all in, in my group, right, my team, I was one of the guy crazy about jujitsu because when when I say crazy about jujitsu, about positions, at the like back to nineties, we don't have the internet and Google, nothing. I used to go to the tournament with like a, a piece of paper and a pen, and watch the fights. So whatever is still like new positions coming, we put it on, and I bring to the gym to try set it up again and duplicate because before they had like a secret game, everybody has your own position. Gracie Barra, Alliance, Esso Cavallo, these guys, Nova Union. But now if you click YouTube, very bold, you see thousands and thousands and thousands, the information is too quick now. So the way we could have discovered the secret games was with my notes and, and pain. So watch it. Oh, I see the guy put the hook this. Oh, I see like he used the lapel doing that. So oh, I get the note and then I get home, you know, and I try. And then I just, I get a lot of things from this, you know, thank God. It's definitely <laughs> a different experience because, you know, tournaments and competitions in the, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s was, you know, a little bit different because of that learning environment of that's where a lot of the information exchange was occurring to where now it's moved online to where you can watch videos of fights and people's specialties and techniques, which has kind of changed the interaction with students. 
to where, you know, now when you go to class, a lot of your students are very familiar with some very advanced, elaborate things, mm -hmm. but fundamentals and details that they miss. So, you know, as a coach now, I feel like there's almost more time spent in filling in blanks versus in explaining new ideas. Kind of. Absolutely. You know, another thing to what I realize is, right, you see the internet, a lot of people put a lot of things, but to be honest, in my own opinion, 80% of the things that people post it is garbage. 20% is good, you have the good things, but you gotta know why you search, and you know how to filter as well. And sometimes the purple belt and the brown belt doesn't know how to filter what's good and what's not good. And sometimes they come crazy with the question, professor, let's say somebody, if you hold the ear like this, can I choke the guy? <laughs> no, how about it's on the internet like this? You know, no one works, they don't show the right way. Or sometimes people show missing details. So it's good, but you cannot go crazy the internet and just everything for internet, you know? I still believe in the gist of practice on the mat. You can search, you can, you know, see new things, what happened, but in the end of the day, you gotta bring it in and do on the mat because that's the only way you can make this effect in the real life. If you're not drill enough, you're never gonna be good. You can watch, 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 but if you don't come to the real practice and put the thing on, it's not gonna work, you know. It's gonna be good here, but in the end of the day, you know. And that's what it comes back to, is application. Yes, brother, yes. Well, I appreciate the time. It was a wonderful story, great insight. Um, very glad to talk with you. Thanks for making time for me. Is there anything that you'd like to finish with? Okay, first, let you know, thank you very much for this opportunity. You know, like, yeah, I mean, it's an honor to be with you guys. And um, if you get, tell me, get a trail, three things, at first I'm gonna tell, guys, stay home where this whole thing happens. When this thing's over, Let's get back to jujitsu, all right? And let's live the life happy with martial arts. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcio. We'll definitely be in touch, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Caleb. What a great pleasure. Bye, guys. Thank you very much.